Welcome to Game Set Chat at a distance. I'm Chanda Rubin, as always, alongside Zena Garrison. Zena, how's your week been going? Ooh, Chanda, girl. <laughs> Look, I'm not used to a nine to six job, but your girl got a nine to six job. And, you know, I'm just trying to do my part. Um, I'm a COVID-19 tracer here in Houston, and uh, it's been interesting. I'm learning a lot. So, I'm just getting my rhythm. <laughs> now, how how are things in Houston? I'm in Louisiana. Things in, in Lafayette in particular, things have been, you know, pretty low key. Everybody's kind of getting somewhat back to normal. We really haven't been. We've still been mostly staying home, going out, you know, for things we need and, and certain basics, visiting a little bit more in terms of my parents. But otherwise, things seem kind of back to normal. What? How are things where you are? Well, actually, you know, it's been a, an... an like an incredible week just for Houston, um, just because unfortunately, you know, the passing of George Floyd, but this was his hometown. So, we, you know, one day we had 60,000 people um, oh, out wow. in Discovery Green. It was absolutely amazing. And then also the, just the home going the other day was just, you know, so Houston's been on fire for that, but, you know, really mm -hmm. sad. And I'm so proud to say, you know, my mayor, just passed where you know uh an executive decision for no chokehold so you know that's so fantastic we're ha happy today about that yeah it's good when we can kind of see some progress but i mean it's gonna take time and it seems i think one of the good things is that so many people have stepped up and are supportive are behind change and i mean that's that's the best that you can hope for after you know a horrific event like that Fortunately yeah. for us, we're kind of still doing our thing. You know, one of the reasons we started this show was to keep connecting with people to you know provide a little bit of entertainment, you know, some tennis talk going on, but also talking about other things too. And and so it's been fun. And I'm excited about today's show in particular because we have, without further ado, my friend for since forever and a fantastic person. I don't have to say all of her accolades, but I will. But we're going to bring her in first because I want to embarrass her. Lindsay Davenport <laughs> is joining us today. And I am going, I'm, I'm going to go through her whole resume no, right no, here. Just, just the major stop stuff. There. She's going to have to sit and listen to it. And I love it. No, no, I love no. it. Because <laughs> I'm going to shut off her I mic. Wanna... And then she... <laughs> stop the yellow, Lindsay. <laughs> now, this is true I just want to chat with Dina, Chanda. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to kick me off. I mean, it, look, it goes without saying, uh, you know, I don't have to go through it, but I just want to hit some of the main points. You are number one in the world in singles and doubles. You were number one for 98 weeks. You were year in number one for four different years, only five players in history. You're one of five that have accomplished that feat four or more times. You were inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2014, three major titles in singles, major titles in doubles as well, an Olympic gold medal. Wow. I'm just hitting the basics here. We're not gonna even keep going because I can see you're like, shooting daggers at me, but I mean, this is just fantastic. And we celebrate that. And I thank you for coming on today and hopefully we'll have a good fun chat. <laughs> we will always have fun. I'm so excited to chat with Zeta because I haven't seen Zeta much over the last few years and fascinated by your job right now, Zeta. That is incredible. All props to you for doing that. Lindsay, more props because I don't know how long I'm going to stay on it, but <laughs> we'll but, see. You know, it's so funny because I told Chin, I was like, we got to get Lindsay on here and stuff. And she's like, we are, we are, we are. But, you know, and it's so funny because when I always think about you, a lot of people don't know how funny you are. That's what I always think about. Like, what a big sense of humor you have. You know, you see you on the tennis channel and everybody's like, Lindsay's so serious. I'm like, not really. <laughs> I think I acted like so either mad or pissed off when I played that it doesn't <laughs> normally come across at all. But um, yeah, no, I get it all the time. Like, oh, you're so miserable and grouchy. I go, no, I'm really not. I should try and take that. But that's not how my day to day life is. But I well, don't know. Playing is tough. <laughs> Speaking of day to day, I mean, things obviously are, are a bit different for all of us, primarily being at home, having to adjust. You have four kids. I have one. And then sometimes I have two others added to that. But 
you know, I'm curious. You, of course, have support, which is it's a necessity when you have little ones. But, you know, how do you, how are you managing now? How are things different with you being home? Of course, working still with Tennis Channel, doing work remotely. Um, how are things different? How have you adjusted? And are there some things that you would like to keep in place even when things get back to normal? <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything kind of changed that first uh, weekend in March. And my family and I, we had already gone to Indian Wells and we're in Indian Wells um, that that weekend on Saturday. Um, and it was Sunday morning when I was on site and, and I'd heard from someone who works at the tournament. Yeah, it's going to get canceled later today. And it was like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So right then when we got that, my husband um, put the kids in the car because we had two cars down there. And he's like, see you later. I'm taking the kids home. <laughs> So it gets officially canceled. You can come home. And he started like going into like full lockdown, like prepping the house. He felt like he had like a five or six day jump on, you know, some of the other people around. But, um, and really since then we've been pretty locked down. My kids had like three or four more days of school. Um, mm. Then it went to remote learning. Um, we had my mom move in right away uh, to help oh. us with the kids and to mm. kind of keep her, safe. We figured if we all kind of contained together, it'd be okay. So I have my husband who's working from home. I have my mom um, and myself, and it's just been us locked in this house. The last few weeks, we've started to go out just a little bit more, um, you know, venturing to a couple places, but not really. I mean, we're pretty nervous to get it, especially because my mom's with us and my son has really bad asthma. So mm -hmm. um, it's been, it's been interesting. Uh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like the Wi-Fi. How, how is that going? The Wi-Fi is getting a lot of traffic in everybody's home. <laughs> See, that the Wi-Fi was the one worker, like on week two, that my husband like was like, you have to come in, and he let him in the house because one, you know, seeing all these kind of shows and all yeah. these Zoom calls um, was really important. And then I had four kids trying to log on for distance learning. And that was kind of crazy too. It kind of interrupts the signal. Um, fortunately, they're now done. And I think I speak for all parents that um, I believe, at least in California, schools are now out in Southern California around us. Yeah. And it's like, oh, thank you. Yeah. If I had to fight with my kindergartner one more day, about <laughs> just, just do the math, just add the two numbers. It's not so hard, just do it. <laughs> And, and it's probably worse with you as the parent trying to do the, the learning, trying to help them through. Because I went through the <laughs> same thing with my my ten year old, I, my bonus daughter, and we we were going at it. Because I'm like, look, we're gonna do this, totally. whether yeah. you want to or not. It's either gonna take a long time or a short time, but it's, we're gonna do it. So it's your like we just went through all of the psychological things to try to get them to do stuff in a whole different format. So. <laughs> Yeah. I get it. I could, I managed the like the kind of easy stuff, and I managed our kindergartner, our six year old. Anytime one of the older kids came to me, I'd go, "Wow, you better ask your dad. <laughs> <laughs> you better go ask your dad." So that was like my Then they said, "John is like a saint." Now. He yeah, seems he like is. such he a is. saint. I mean, I cannot imagine a better person <laughs> to have to go through all this with in terms of his personality. Yeah. He's a great partner. Um, I People, it's so funny. I mean, we all played junior tennis together and uh, he was crazy in the juniors. I don't know, whatever. He got defaulted out of Kalamazoo. So he oh, wow. was crazy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, like I know. So, but whatever that happened, like when tennis was out of him competing, like out of his blood, just to comp he's so calm and he's so great with the kids. And so he, you know, in terms of like, responsibilities in the house. I mean, it's for sure 50, 50, if not more leaning tracking towards him, he does whatever and helps the kids all the time. So I'm really lucky. That's awesome. So Lindsay, what are some of your, what, what were some of the favorite subjects that you did like teaching? Oh, um, that's a, <laughs> was there one? <laughs> you know, um, you know, I did, I did, all the work with the kindergartner. And I think I finally, like on like week six or something, realized, okay, probably shouldn't raise your voice anymore. <laughs> probably, um, 
<laughs> you know, but the one thing we really kind of conquered was the reading. And oh, I think yeah. the other kids kind of learned at school, but obviously now this kind of fell on me. And we did like, for those that have kids, like all these sight words, she had all these cards and you try and memorize them. And we went through like 500 of those and we were reading every day. And now like, I really like, she can read, you know, like a little kid's book. And it makes me so happy. Like one of her siblings was walking by the other night and looks at, I didn't know she could read. <laughs> That was the one thing I'm like, I'm kind of like super proud of and kind of weathered that storm and got her through it. That's been so have awesome. you gotten to the have you gotten <laughs> to that part now where I hear everybody say, you know, I don't I, that's not the way we learn math yet, you know. Oh, like my have a whole <laughs> totally, totally. It was um my second grader doing multiplication. I'm like, no, no, you go this way and that way, and then you get yes. this look like. What are you doing? Well, that's I'm like, well, that's when you do it. Yes. That's the easy way. No. Yes. Yes. And I'm like, look, you at home now. This is how we're gonna do it. Okay. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> trying to figure out what you were doing at class with your teacher. This is how we're gonna do it. You're gonna get the same answer. Yeah. Let's keep it moving. Like, <laughs> seven times instead of just going seven times. I don't under. I don't get it. Oh my gosh. Okay. So guys, before we go any further, I wanna I wanna do a little a little throwback here. A little throwback picture, uh, oh Lindsay. You know, the, God, you know the picture I'm talking about. But Zena, okay. <laughs> do you remember this? Oh, look at the worst on me. Look how bad I look. You look at my look hair. Me. Look at my hair. Okay. Wow. Look, look at us. My hair. I'm fat now, so look. <laughs> <laughs> I look adorable. I mean, can no, you imagine no, these no, were Lindsay? Lindsay, that. What happened? I mean, that's amazing. Oh, here. I mean, <laughs> oh, Lindsay, do you remember haircut. this? The haircut. I know. Zena, do you I remember know. where this was? Hey, no. <laughs> <laughs> where was it? I barely know. My no, name. we were trying to figure that out. I mean, obviously, I mean, these I were like four, great. I think we're fourteen there, Chanda. I think we're about you're, you're playing a lot of pros at 15 and 16. And the other players in that picture, as you said, were juniors. Yeah. So I think I, maybe I, like 13 ish or so. That's because I'm looking. Was I, there? I, I mean, something, I'm sure. Give it back time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is amazing. I don't where that was. Because it was what the funny thing was, my mom found this like about a month ago. And I sent it to Chanda, and then Chanda found it at her parents' house. Isn't yes. that right? It's on what? the mantle. We hardly go into this room at my parents' house, but it's on their mantle frame, this exact picture. <laughs> After Lindsay sent it, I, I saw it at my parents a couple of weeks later. It's incredible. <laughs> memories, memories. <laughs> That's <laughs> crazy. So, yeah, so I wanted to yeah, surprise you. I wanted to surprise Zita a little bit with it. So, no, um, that was so a big surprise. <laughs> That, that's a good surprise. Those are cute. We like those. So so we're going to kind of get into some of the questions because we have um, our viewers and, and fans who follow us that are sending in questions every time we have our shows. And of course, you know, immediately, Lindsay, when we um, announced that you're going to be on, questions started coming in. So I'm going to start with um, <clears throat> one question. So we have Patrick Cloacy, who has watched probably all of our shows, um, is asking about the 2005 Wimbledon final. Now, this oh, might be yeah. a little painful, Lindsay, but it was <laughs> it's one of the greatest matches. I mean, it's an incredible match. We've seen it again during quarantine um, with, with some of the other great matches um, that we look back on. And I mean, it was just fantastic. His question is, do you think about that match every now and then, occasionally? You had a match point, I think, um, in the yeah, third. I, you ended, it was seven, nine, seven in the third, I think, that match. It Incredible. Was, I get confused like eight, six, nine, seven, but yeah, <clears throat> you know, it's the match I'm asked most about, and it's the most special match that I was a part of. Unfortunately, I didn't come out on the winner's end. Um, I look back with some regret, you know, I, I won three majors um, and literally uh, won the Australian Open in 2000 and met my husband a week later. Ooh. And so I kind of, yeah, and so he was so instrumental in getting me back from a horrible knee injury and kind of helping me play another eight years. I really wanted to win one 
it might sound corny, but I really wanted to win one as Mrs. Leach, as his wife. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and that was obviously, that was the closest I came, but it was one of the <clears throat> matches where I played, you know, like the best match I ever played that I didn't win. And um, there was Venus on grass was always a problem I could never solve. You know, I played her uh, so many times. I think we played like 27, 28 times. And on grass, though, I couldn't Ooh. figure out how to beat her. And, you know, her balls would skid lower. She'd get more free points on her serve. And she mm -hmm. took me out uh, two Wimbledon finals, a semi, I think a quarters also. She was so, she was just too good for me on that surface. And, you know, you look back and I talked to Martina Hingis about this one. She had an Australian Open, I think against Capriotti, where she was way up, ended up having a match point, And I think Capriotti <coughs> back and won. And I look back and it, it wasn't the match point. It was earlier in the set. I think I was up mm, four, two or a break and, and kind mm -hmm. of lost the match kind of midway through the set. Of course, okay. I could have won a match point, but you know, I, I don't think necessarily go back to match point. I go back to like, I like four, two serving mm -hmm. and some of the, yeah. the points there. But, um, you know, Venus is, there's a reason she won five times there. And unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> I saw yeah. way too many times there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so we have brothers on tennis also who have been following us. I mean, it's, it's been phenomenal, the support they've given. Um, so they want to ask the same year, um, the semifinals at Indian Wells against Maria Sharapova. Mm -hmm. They want you to talk about that. That was, I mean, I got to just say it was a beatdown. And you played <laughs> unbelievably. I'm sorry. This no, is shade, no shade. No shade at all. This is just facts. What it was. I mean, what? How? How did you play so cleanly, start to finish, against a tough opponent who has the ability to turn the tables and be aggressive on her side of the court? How? How did that match unfold the way it did for you? Yeah, it it is so strange. I mean, Sharapova. Um, I'd always heard that she had started, um, her father, Yuri flew her out to Southern California to take lessons for Robert Landstrup because he watched me play in like the, you know, somewhere in the nineties. Um, and I met Maria when she was really young, we played like five times. And the irony is that's the only time I won <laughs> I was, I was oh, wow. all the time. I know. But on that day, um, you know, Indian Wells was one of my favorite tournaments. It was where I turned pro. I grew up playing. I grew up going out there to watch. So I always, um, you know, wanted to play really well there. And that was one of those days where, okay, you know, you guys know how it goes. You play really well in the first set. And especially against a, a good player, you know, you're like, oh, gosh, this is she's going to change things now early in the second. <laughs> and I remember, like, the score just kind of kept going, like, 6 2 Six oh three, and I remember then, like looking over at her on the changeover, like, okay, she's gonna call the trainer or retire or something, right? And I give her so much credit. <laughs> no, because like, I'm like, this can't be happening. And I swear, I give her so much credit. She never said a word. She never made one excuse. She went back out there, like competing, jumping up and down. Obviously, something was not right. I don't know what it was, but it, mm. it was kind of one of those things where I don't know when you get on a roll and it's like. It's crazy. What happened though, the match before, I think I won this the second set 6-0. So I had 6-0 in the quarters in the last set. And then I was up 6-0, 6-0. And then in the final, I was up four love. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. All these games in a row. And then I lost the game. And then I was then we my whole box started laughing. Like they were like <laughs> TV and stuff. But I don't know. It was the best tennis I ever played for like four sets over three or four different days. Mm -hmm. So obviously that ball was really big. In, in the public yeah. parks, we always say you just got two donuts, okay? Two yeah. donuts. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take that it. Is, that's it. <laughs> so I want to go back a little bit, Lindsay, because I, yeah. I, I was always been really like enamored with um, you know, your mom and getting into tennis and just both, you know, you and your husband just being athletes, you know, an athletic family. I mean, that has to be really cool. Yeah, I always felt I was, I mean, really lucky. Chanda and I were both born in 76. And so growing up in the early 80s, I mean, sports was becoming a bigger deal, but not like every girl was doing sports mm -hmm. or getting yeah. pushed that way. And both my parents were like, I was the youngest of three girls, was like, you guys are going to do sports. I don't care which one it is. You know, <laughs> that really wanted us... <laughs> <laughs> to play volleyball and my two sisters did and he just kind of thought and my mom too that I would go into volleyball um and 
found tennis and always wanted to play. And they were really good at being good sporting parents and realizing they knew nothing about tennis. And so mm -hmm. never tried to like correct a stroke or anything. Of course, there were days where it's like, oh, I'm not going to practice. And my mom's like, yes, you are. Get your butt in the car. <laughs> you know, I paid for this already. We're not missing that. Or one time I wanted to quit and my dad's like, oh, okay, well, let's, you know, let's go. I think it was like the softball. Let's go see the softball team tomorrow. I was like, no, no, I, I don't want to do that either. I just <laughs> <laughs> that was like so that didn't last long either. Um, but they were, you know, it's an independent, it's an individual sport. You have to be independent. Mm -hmm. And they definitely let me be independent or made me be independent from a young age. And so that that really helped kind of me figure out I was doing it for myself. What did I want to do? Of course, I, I made mistakes along the way. There was times where I wasn't really practicing my hardest and giving it my all and but you know what i figured it out and probably wouldn't have figured it out on my own without them kind of letting me figure it out mm -hmm. so yeah. what are some of the lessons that you and john are passing along well i wish <laughs> this this is a great one so john was the youngest of four <laughs> and he likes to say like he was just like just begging for scraps of anybody's like attention or like it's bad <laughs> to just hit him a few balls and he figured it out too but um you know, being active is a big deal in our house. Of course, mm -hmm. as I always tell Chanda, we have four kids. None of them play the same sport. It's like, really, guys? Not two of you? <laughs> or like, we can't be the family where everybody loves to play tennis. We could do that pretty easily. Um, but my son loves to play tennis. Mm -hmm. My next one plays volleyball. The one after that, the girl, she plays basketball. And the youngest, as Chanda knows, I just we just try to stay out of her way, <laughs> try to get her something <laughs> a little bit every day. Um, but being active, um, you know, being uh, respectful of whatever coach, whatever adult is giving you advice, um, and trying to be problem solvers. It's not easy as parents. You always try and like figure things out or not make them sad. And yeah, I've learned the, after more kids, like it's okay for them to be, to be sad or to be disappointed. Mm. And they're going to have to kind of learn to deal with those emotions. My older two, I wasn't great at that. The, the younger two kind of been learning like, no, it's okay. She can, she can go pout or she can be sad. Um, she's got to figure it out. Yeah. Well, okay. So Lindsay, I'm going to bring it to a little petty, petty level because you talk Ooh. about the kids and lessons here you know so we traveled together when we were kids you know like pl oh, and no, no, together no, playing no, doubles no, staying no. in the same hotel room and you know so always we had two different sides one was like a disaster zone and one was neat no as Tina. neat no as, as a pen cushion. <laughs> you can imagine who was neat and who was the disaster zone. So I'm curious, are you teaching your kids <laughs> some of those, those same things here? <laughs> okay. That is, that is very petty. I'm glad you bring that up. I, I was. <laughs> Um, that is unfortunately true. The other thing Chanda used to do when she had had enough of me, we're like traveling at 13, 14, 15. She'd just pull out a book. And just, I knew you were going to say that. And I'd be like, Chanda, hey, you know, like, she's like, just don't talk to me. <laughs> That's how I knew I, I, I was on her nerve when she would start doing that. What, what um, oh, my that. goodness. Don't feel bad because she, I, when I used to preach to her, she'd pull the book out on me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you only had to worry if I pulled the dictionary out because then I was oh, like, okay, okay. I'm, I'm not sure even that happened. I'm sure. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> not with you though. <laughs> so, May I bet you? What are some embarrassing know. moments for Chanda? None. That you can remember. None. Oh gosh, why didn't you tell me, text me this before? Because oh, thinking on the spot. There were none, um, Lindsay. That's all that's you have to say. True. That's not true. <laughs> I'm gonna get one here. There are none. I mean, I'm we're sure you know. Back to it. <laughs> no, I'm sure we like escaped. It was something we did. I forget which tournament, but it was something. Uh, we we talked about this in Australia this year. So we were. 15 maybe turning 16 that year and i'm not going to say any names but we were at a tournament together with a usta coach 
<laughs> and he got mad at one or both of us in practice. Do you remember this? And he was gone. And we're like looking around. He left the practice, no problem. Then like it turned into like dinner, no, not there, whatever. We, what? went, we got up this morning to, to warm up. And we're warming up, and I'm freaking out. And Amanda's like, who cares? We're fine. <laughs> She's like trying to like calm me down. We go and play our doubles match. Not there. We remember we had to get on the train yeah. together. I don't know yeah, what we had our bags and everything. Like, like you've got the schedule. And you yeah. have the teenagers. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. It was easier in Europe traveling. Yeah, and it was like, what, it was in 91, I think, or maybe yeah. 92. We made it to Wimbledon. There was a different coach there. We moved on. We never, <laughs> ever found out what happened. <laughs> he showed up at Wimbledon. Like, nothing, like, he didn't, nothing bad happened to him, but he just left us. <laughs> okay, when we get off, I want to know who that is. When we get off, I want to know who that is. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that that brings back some memories. Um, so, so Lindsay, I'm curious. I know how much the Olympics has meant to you, and winning the Olympics in 1996. I mean, that seemed to really set your career on its path. What was so special about the Olympics? I know you've talked about it before, our listeners. You know, just to get a sense um, of of that moment for you, and also what changed during that week, week and a half. Yeah, it was it was kind of a a, a, a strange year. I was 19, yeah. 20, 20, and I think kind of realizing like, okay, this is really a job. You're not going to go to college. <laughs> like, people are really this is a job. And um, then actually, it was hard for me to to grasp. I mean, again, we're so young and we're trying to live this life of like knowing it all and trying to be mm -hmm. perfect out there and train hard and do all this stuff. And it, it was like a little overwhelming for me, even though the results were fine. Um, and then we went to Atlanta and Chanda, you were there. I mean, in yeah. the beginning, we went, we walked in opening ceremonies. Mm -hmm. It's still one of the most amazing moments of my whole life. Yeah. It was Gigi and Monica, Mary Jo, you, Billy. I mean, we're walking down into this. I mean, no one, we're not used to walking into what a hundred or a hundred thousand people just going crazy for team USA. Um, and I'll got the goosebumps. Muhammad Ali lights the torch. We didn't know that. And all of a sudden I really felt comfortable. We were at the village a bunch and I'm like, yeah, these are people that, that I understand. And like, they're all going for, look, I'm so inspired by seeing all these different athletes, different shapes, different sizes, different sports. Um, and it was like really one of the first times in a few years since I left high school where I felt like this is so awesome. I love this. I'm so happy right now. It wasn't just staying in a hotel room or flying by yourself or, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of just always stress. So um, something definitely clicked that way. I, I don't really know what happened tennis wise, like obviously just was relaxed and so playing well. Um, and then the night before the final, like Billy sat me down and most people <laughs> try and lessen the pressure on myself to not get myself too stressed out. Like, oh my God, it's so good. I'm gonna get a silver medal. I'm so happy. And she was one of the first people to like sit me down and was like, there is a mm -hmm. huge difference between first and second. And uh, yeah. I say, you can't let it be okay. And I, this is a huge moment. And she <clears throat> got me in that mindset. And um, I, you know, I don't know, things just kind of go together, but uh, there was a couple important pieces along those 10 days or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. and, um, it just kind of was magical and, and kind of all fell in line. And, you know, I still, it's it's overwhelming. I, I still can't believe it. Do you still have any friends from the Olympics? Like one of my best friends is Jackie Joyner Kirsty, who I met in the 1980. Uh, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no new friends. <laughs> yeah, just, just the tennis ones. No, <laughs> uh, yeah. um, I'm just kidding. But like, I <clears throat> for a lot of the people I met were in volleyball because of my parents, Misty May Trainer. Um, her dad and my dad were on the Olympic team together. So we were always pretty close. Um, although she wasn't in Atlanta, she started, um, in Sydney, but, um, you know, it, it's crazy. You're like walking around and I'll never forget in 2000 in Sydney, we're on the field and Venus and Serena are on the team. And like, that was the first time I realized like, oh my gosh, how famous are these two? When we got onto the field after walking around the stadium, literally everyone was running over to the dream team or Venus and Serena. And it was mm -hmm. 
remarkable. And I hadn't really realized their global impact until that Olympics in Sydney, that night of opening ceremonies. Well, that's yeah, funny because I, I didn't either yeah. until uh, this guy ran up to me and he says, the prince wants to meet Venus and Serena. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, he's like yeah. the king of, you know, an African country. And I was like, what? Like, yeah. I, I remember thinking, this is on a whole nother level that I don't have any yeah, understanding. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And especially when you are in an environment where there are so many other great athletes in their sports, you really, you yeah. really see it how how big in the certain individuals are, and it crosses, you know, the lines of of that particular sport. And so it, I think for that, the Olympics, I mean, it just brings all that together. It's in, it's incredible. And you two, of course, having won gold medals, Zena. So I, I mean, you kind of we talked about that in previous shows, Zena. Just what that experience is like, you know, you doing it on a team, you know, being part of Team USA. You know, was it a little bit different for you, your experience compared to what Lindsay was just talking about? Well, just more than anything, it's just like you're just a small part of a big, yeah. you know, group of athletes, which, you know, you as Lindsay mentioned, <laughs> when you get there, you just realize you're part of a fraternity and it's like really cool. And, you know, the work that everyone's put in. And so it's really, you know, it's it's nothing like like nothing like it at all. I mean, it's mm -hmm. still to this day. If I go somewhere, people will say, can you bring your gold medal? I'm like, what? <laughs> like, that was way back then, but it's, it's big, thing. yeah. And Lindsay, Lindsay can say, you know, it's one thing that it brings everybody together because yeah. but the biggest thing for me is it's really when you win something for your country and you have that gold medal or that bronze medal and they see it when you're watching the news that night and they see it, check it off and you're like, I'm one of those people. Yeah, it's really cool. It's really cool. And, you know, I think the cool part about it as well is, you know, it doesn't matter what decade you played in, mm -hmm. where when you won your gold medal. It's like it's like that currency that is it's just it, it determines the value of everything else. And so whether you've won a goal in the 1980s versus winning a gold medal in 2000, 2010, it, it doesn't matter. People just look at you with this type of respect, <laughs> the fact that you were one of the best in your country to be playing at the Olympics and then to come through in the most pressure filled situations. One of the few that get um, a gold medal, relatively speaking. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Just the respect people have for that accomplishment. And that well, goes Lindsay, on through your whole know, career. I don't know about you, Lindsay. I just think the medals have gotten better. <laughs> so they <Yeah>. look better. <laughs> look, people, people who haven't won one, they, they don't say so. They say, no, nah, it's a go. Every time Can you bring it. The Olympics, the city, the city or the city announces it, and they'll always show the medals right before the games and like they're they're um you know, whatever they design for their medal. And I'm yeah. always checking it out, Z. <laughs> What is it like? <laughs> Compare it to your own, the design on it. Yeah. Okay, I, I got that. That's pretty cool. So I'm going to, I want to ask a couple more questions um, here. So we have Natalie Rogers who sent one in and Susan Nardi who's been sending um, questions in every show. Um, they kind of tie together. So um, they've kind of both, both asked about you playing so many different great players over the course of your career, you know, from obviously the Williams sisters who we've talked about, but Kim Kleisters, Justine Enna, Steffi Graf, Monica Sellis. I don't know if you played Martina Navratilova, but she was yeah. um, still playing. Um, so one question, who was your toughest opponent from Natalie? And then Susan is wondering if you could build your bionic woman tennis player out of, you know, the best features of, of some of those. <laughs> And and you can keep your own game, Lindsay. If that's, yeah. I mean, you're entitled to do that too. <laughs> what would your bionic women's <laughs> women's tennis player look like? <laughs> okay, so I played my first pro event in '91 and my last one in 2008. So those 17, 18 years, lots of um, different players, a couple different generations. Um, I played Martina um, Navratilova in singles. Her her last few months, I played her up in Oakland. Um, I got my butt kicked by Zena at the US Open one year, like you couldn't win games. <laughs> I I went through like a period of like four or five years where I could not win a game off Conchita Martinez. She would just, she would see my name on the draw and start laughing. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're gonna angle, we're gonna lobber. And I was like, oh. Um, Steffi, obviously, the two that stand out the most are Serena and Steffi. And there's no, no, re no surprises. They're the two greatest players that we've ever had play our game. Mm -hmm. um, it was it, for both of them, like when they were at their best, it, their footwork, their um, athleticism, their serve, but also their ability to like the bigger the point, the better they got. The better They're they are, yeah. never really thought like, okay, it's break point. I've really got her now. Like sh they, she looks really down. I mean, both of them in different ways. You, you'd see it more with Serena than you would with Steph. Um, but the same kind of mentality, the bigger the point, both of them were, are like, bring it on. And that yeah. was different from almost everybody else that I ever played. The Belgians in the 2000 years, they were so good at playing offense and defense. Um, but I always go back to Serena and Steph. Mm -hmm. okay, and so, player. so your bionic player, who, what would you okay, take and from whom? No, no surprise there. Serve, you serve, say yeah. that again. Okay. But your serve is. You're well, no. stop. Like, <laughs> I can build the player, not you. <laughs> you the player. I can build my player. So, okay. Serve Serena. Uh forehand Steph. Hmm. I think the I think the movement I'd probably go Steffi also. Like those little okay. steps are like amazing. Um okay, the backhand. That's you better put your backhand in there. I mean, come on. Backhand. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, Martina Polly's. <laughs> okay. Um, what else am I missing? Backhand and what else? Um, return. Well, return Celis. Return go. Celis, yeah. At, which, at her best, I, I forgot yeah. to say her. I mean, she was incredible. I didn't play her before, um, unfortunately, her stabbing in 93. I only played her after. I would sit there and watch her play all the time. So mm -hmm. firsthand never had the experience when she was at her very best. Um, and the backhand, I don't know. I will your, your own for sure. Yes. Come on. Well, you got it, you know. Linda, your backhand. Yeah, you got to put your backhand in there. Look, I mean, I, we'll I, add to you. We'll add to you for you, <laughs> your backhand. <Is> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're we're putting we're putting it in there. Okay, we're making an executive I'll, I'll decision. Gonna, just like I'm going to think of a story to embarrass you here pretty soon. <laughs> I'm get no. no, don't do that. Don't do that. So, so one one other question I want to get in because we're getting to our last like five minutes or so. But Brothers on Tennis had a second one. Um, they're wondering if you would ever consider being uh, the Fed Cup captain, Olympic team oh, captain. I know those kind of jobs usually go hand in hand, um, you know, with, yeah. the US, with the USA, but would you ever consider that? Um, why or why not? Yeah, it would be uh, a huge honor. And I was <clears throat> so blessed to have, I played under four captains. My first year was Marty Reeson, then it went to mm -hmm. Billy. Martina took over for one, for one year um, yeah. in there, and then it was Zena. So um, <laughs> I was pretty lucky, obviously. Um, but I don't know. I mean, to be in that role and to be successful, you have to have great relationships with all the players and you don't know who's going to play. It's not just the, the the first few on the ranking list. It's all the way down the list. And I can't say that I'm all that familiar, like not familiar. I know all the players' names and their games, but I'm not, don't know them that well personally. Um, I think it also is an incredible amount of of work as it should be, it, it's a huge honor. I'm not sure at this point right now in my life, it it's something that would work with my kids and the amount of time needed. Um, but of course, I mean, when you grow up and you play Fed Cup and you play the Olympics, of course you, you always wanna be a part of it. Um, but I think the US girls right now are pretty fortunate to have Kathy leading them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So one of, one, of, one of my last questions is I remember um, asking you a question when you came back and you started to make your run to be number one. And I asked you about your workout, changing your workout. You remember having that conversation? And you told me, Zena, I'm doing a lot of two on ones. Yeah. And I, was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I kept saying, What? And you're like, No, that I'm doing two on ones. And I remember going out and watching you practice. And I was like, She ain't loud. She really does two on ones. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's a weird story. I mean, everybody has their own weird path to the top. Like I didn't feel really comfortable 
kind of being in my position or my job till I was like 22 and I turned pro at like 16. Yeah. So I kind of like managed a few years. I probably underachieved. I wasn't, I wasn't training really off the court. I had been a junior player. It had come fairly easily to me. Like, I don't mind standing on the court. I could hit balls all day long. Like, Oh, I have to run a mile. Like, no, thanks. <laughs> When you go to that, like, and so the tennis part was the fun part of it. All of a sudden it's a job and to do really well required a lot more. And it took me a number of years to either to accept that or to be okay with that. And then it was like, okay, now I get it. Okay. I am going to run, mm -hmm. or try to run for every ball in practice. Okay. I got to give whatever now in the gym. And so things really started to change for me when I was either mature enough to accept it. Like, okay, this oh, yeah. Yeah, this is what's got to happen now. I wish it could have been at 17. I mean, I look at some of the players that have come up. I mean, there's one in a million where it's Coco Goff, who at 15 or whatever age, even at 14, she was training like a professional. It, it wasn't that way for me. It took much longer. And so when I got it and I understood what I needed to do, then then I got it. And I felt like then I did a, a, a good job when I wasn't injured. But um, there was a number of years there where I'm like, oh, when they play those highlights, when I'm like in my teen years, I just like, I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to watch those. <laughs> and the other thing I liked about you and Chanda, both manage your schedules well. I used to always use that with younger players. When I would talk, I would use you too, you know, telling them that they need to learn how to manage their, their schedule. I was always surprised teaching younger players and they had no clue what I was talking about when it came to that, you know, mm -hmm. or practicing. Oh, I mean, totally. Chanda and I, when we would travel to juniors, I mean, we were both homebodies. Like we missed home and we wanted to go home. And um, I don't think we ever looked at it like, oh, if I don't play next week, someone else might get ranking points or yeah, it's never really no. about that. And it, it became clear to me, OK, what is the maximum I can be on the road and still play at a, at a decently high level? And that pretty honestly, it ended up being like four weeks max. And like I didn't want to do yeah. that very often. So it was like, OK. And then I could kind of gear up for for that long road trip, maybe twice a year and trying to keep everything else shorter. But. I, Andy Roddick has a great outlook and he said, you know, it was easier for him to transition after playing because his personal life wasn't necessarily on the road. You know, he uh, had a uh -huh. great life at home and I think that helped. I mean, I always miss my family. I always um, was like, okay, I'm never missing Christmas. I'm never going to do these things. And I stuck to that and I tried to make myself happy and still play. And I know Chanda kind of followed that same mentality as well. Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, it's kind of carried over sort of post tennis as well, that that idea um, and, and how you go about your your life, your months and weeks that you are out there still. And, and I'm curious, kind of segueing into that, last, this will sort of be you know my last question, last topic. But mm -hmm. since retiring, you've transitioned into broadcasting and, you know, I mean, you're fantastic. And and this is not just to make you blush, but I mean, yeah, you yeah, you yeah. really, and I'm not going to keep going on that. But I'm <laughs> curious, how did how did the transition sort of happen for you, and how how have you sort of honed your voice and and how you you know how you talk about the game, how, what your style is, how did that sort of evolve? Well, it's so funny. Um, so I lost. Um, in the 2008 US Open, I think it was maybe the third round or something. And anyways, came home and had a 14 month old or 15 month old son. And we're trying to figure out like, okay, I'm going to take the fall off. Am I going to play next year? Um, I don't really know. My knee was kind of bad. And so I was talking about it a lot with my husband. And it was like, literally a week later, I found out I was pregnant again. So oh. I was like, okay, well, clearly, <laughs> clearly <laughs> we're not so done playing. <laughs> and, um, Tennis Channel was based, is still based here in Southern California. And at that same time, a guy named Larry Myers, he was running it then, reached out and asked if I had any interest, if I wasn't playing in the fall of coming into the studio in a couple of days and just kind of, you know, testing it out and checking it out. And it was like, I didn't tell anyone, but yeah, I won't be playing this fall. So sure, I, <laughs> it sounds good. Um, and that's kind of how it started. And um, over the course of the last 11 years, um, like as Chanda knows, I mean, they're now like a family to me and um, mm -hmm. everybody who works there, I just adore. And it became very easy. I had a lot of great help along the way in either 
people I worked with play by play or producers that would try and sit me down because it was the first thing I'd ever done. Like there aren't really broadcasting coaches or yeah. certainly not yeah. one that I was, people were trying to help me. Um, and so you get to, when you get to work with people that are all about the product and not worried about themselves and you respect them, it was great. Ted Robinson would talk to me a lot about try his style and what he liked to convey during matches. Um, Bill McAtee was another one who was very nice to me, uber professional and, and what he liked to bring to it as well. Ian Eagle. I mean, there's so many amazing people um, that were working with me and they were the hosts and they would say like what they like to hear. So yeah. I would try and get from that. You'd, you'd hear from viewers and what they like. And then you realize you're not going to please everyone. Some people like technical <laughs> stuff. Some people like gossipy stuff. So mm -hmm. you're yeah. like, okay, where do I go today? Um, but I realized I, I like doing it because I like the people that I was doing it with. And um, they helped take care of us, Chanda, on the road. We were crying on the airplane to Australia this year. <laughs> And oh, that picture you guys was so cute. Oh, the mask too. Yeah. Oh, oh my, my goodness. God. But I want to give kudos know. to I want to give kudos to both of y'all though because you know, Chanda, you know, tell you, Lindsay, she knows me better than a little better than you do. I just come straight at it. Ain't no line going on right here. Um, <laughs> you two are are my favorite because you guys don't do all the gossiping that you stick to tennis and you, it's very teachable. Now you you do throw in a little shade sometimes, but sometimes, you, you know- <laughs> Only you good, know that, Zena. You know, Only you good. know is shade, <laughs> if, if we but do. I like the way y'all throw in the shade, but you're still teaching the young ones, you know? So keep up the good work <laughs> to both of y'all. <laughs> I don't know, Lindsay. I, I, I don't. What shade do you throw? I, I, I have no idea what she's talking I'm about. Yeah, I'm yeah, trying yeah, to I'm think back. Okay. You're <laughs> totally impartial in this role. Totally impartial. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, this is this has been fantastic, and we always I always have to be careful of the time because you know we we start having fun, the time just goes. But Lindsay, we are so thrilled that you made a little bit of time for us with your busy schedule, and this has been another another fantastic chat. It was just nice to get a little different side of you and also kind of catch up on some of these fun stories, go back down memory lane. So thank you. <laughs> thank you guys for having oh me. Um, so Thanks, guys, guys. that is it for another episode of Game Set Chat at a distance. Thank you all for watching. Please continue to follow us on social media. Thank you for sending in your questions. Hope you enjoyed the show. See you next time.